Hello! Today we'll be going over torque and rotational inertia within objects. I've hired the help of the create mod from suggestions in the comments, so thank you, and hopefully they will be able to further drive home the points. So to begin, let's start with rotational inertia. It is signified by the symbol iota, which just looks like an I, with units of kilograms times meter squared. In the rotational video from before, we discussed how rotational inertia was basically the mass of the angular world. And since we're not measuring how hard it is to move in a linear direction and instead how hard it is to spin, we have different formulas. More specifically, rotational inertia equals the summation of m times r squared, m being the mass and r being the, ra uh, the radius from the pivot. So this might be a bit confusing at first, but here's an example. Let's say this spinning fan has two blades. One has length of 4 meters, and the end has a 20 kilogram mass, and the other is 6 meters away with a 40 kilogram mass at the end. Assume that the blade itself has no mass, and so what is the rotational inertia of the system? So since it's summation, we just have to find the two elements that do have mass and add them together. One mass would be 20 kilograms, and since it's 4, four meters away from the pivot, we do 20 times 4 squared, giving us 320. Then the other mass, 40 times 6 squared, gives us 1440. Now we add those together and that gives us a total rotational inertia of 1760 kilograms meters squared. This works with any question that deals with simple particle masses that don't have their own volume. However, you'll encounter many other questions with complex shapes which have masses along the volume. Now to derive these equations, we will have to use calculus, but that's for another video. For now, these are the equations for the complex shapes. There's no need to memorize them, they give it to you on the test. Yeah, you don't have to cram them all in your head. Now it's very important to note each of the pivot points that they use and how moving the pivot point changes the rotational inertia. You can see with the stick, if the pivot point is through the center, it's 1 12th, but if it's through the end, it's 1 3rd. So let's further explore what happens when we move the pivot point. Say that we have this cylinder with mass 100 kilograms and radius 6 meters. But then we're going to do something wild, we're going to do something crazy and place the pivot point here. A pivot point 3 meters away from the center and just completely off center and makes the spin look really really weird. And the question is what is the rotational inertia of this object? Now this is where we have to use one more new formula that we haven't learned yet, the parallel axis theorem. Since the center axis and the new axis are parallel, we can use this formula. The formula is I equals I sub C plus M H squared. M is the mass of the object, while H is the distance between the center axis and this new axis. The I sub C is the moment of inertia if we had put the pivot in the middle. So by this formula, our new moment of inertia equals I sub C plus 100 times 3 squared. 100 since the mass is 100 kilograms, and 3 since the distance between the center and the new axis is 3 meters. So now what is I sub C? Well, if we look at the moment of inertia formula page, we can see that a solid cylinder equals 1 half MR squared. And since the axis is in the center, it gives us 1 half times 100 times 6 squared, giving us 1,800 kilograms meter squared. Now all we have to do is add up the values, and we get 1,800 plus 900, which, gives, uh, which equals 2,700 kilograms meter squared. So you would use the parallel axis theorem if you knew the rotational inertia of one situation, and you just need to apply it to a different situation. So now let's move on to more torque questions. We've only been dealing with purely rotational inertia questions and now let's do torque questions. Torque is signified by tau with units newton meters. There are two formulas for torque. Tau equals force times radius times sine theta and tau equals iota alpha. Let's explore the first one. So force is the amount of force I'm applying to the rotation, while sine theta makes sure that the component of force is always perpendicular to the rotation. That means if I were to push at an angle, not all the force would be transferred into torque. 
Now this makes sense because let's say that you're pushing directly towards the pivot point. All that force is not rotating the thing at all. So that means since sine theta equals zero, force, no matter how high force is, torque will always be zero because of the angle. Now the radius means how far away I am. The further away I am, the more torque I'm applying. Think of a wrench where I need to screw something in even further, I would use a longer wrench to apply more torque, even if I'm using the same force. Just as a practice question, let's say that I'm pushing this fan with 4 newtons, while the distance between me and the pivot is 5 meters. The question is, how much torque am I applying? Well, this one is actually quite easy. Just multiplying the 4 and the 5 together gives us 20 newton meters of force. Now let's up explore the second equation. Tau equals iota alpha. This is the angular version of Newton's second law and is crucial in solving wheel problems. So to begin, net torque equals iota alpha similar to the equation net force equals ma. This basically means that the angular acceleration or alpha is correlated with torque. So if a wheel is turning at a constant rate like this one, we can assume that the net torque is zero since there's no angular acceleration. Now, of course, this doesn't mean that there are no forces at play, it just means that the torques cancel out. Now, moving on from here, it's just the same thing as linear force equations. Sum the torques that go in one direction while you subtract the torques that go in the other way. You can choose either way, clockwise or counterclockwise, to be positive, and it will just give you either a negative or positive answer. Once you sum them all up, that equals the moment of inertia multiplied by the angular acceleration, exactly as it equals ma. So this can actually be applied to anything that spins around a pivot, not just a wheel. So let's look at this uniform mass stick. Basically a uniform stick means that there's equal mass at each point. Let's say that this stick has a mass of 10 kilograms and a length of 4 meters. It will fall, but I'm here to save the day and I try to push it perpendicularly with some force at the end of the stick. However, I'm too weak and the stick still falls angularly accelerating at a speed of 3 radians per second squared. The question is now, what was the force that I was applying? To solve this question, it's important to know what torques are at play here. Always take notes of what the forces or torques are. The force torque is me. And since I'm pushing the bar perpendicularly, we can just do F times R to get 4F. And F, since F is the value we're going to solve for, we can just leave it as F. Now the other force is going to be gravity. I'm pushing against gravity in this case. We know the force of gravity, mg, but what is the radius? Well, since gravity is always applied at the center of mass, we can assume that this uniform stick's center of mass is, well, the center of the stick. And since we know that the center of mass is located 2 meters away from the pivot, we can then draw an mg force line downwards, which, is, which happens to be perpendicular in this case, resulting in mg times 2. So in the end, we get 2 times 10 times 10, which equals 200 newton meters. So then going back to the full picture, we know that the stick rotates in gravity's direction, making 2 newton meters positive, while the 4f negative. 200 minus 4f equals iota alpha. Now the iota alpha is a bit easier. Alpha equals 3, while the moment of inertia will follow the formula on the sheet we were given earlier. We can see that this is a stick pivoting at the end, so the equation will be 1 third ml squared. m is 10, while the length is 4. So this gives us 160 divided by 3, and then multiply 3 from the alpha. So the net torque equals 160 newton meters, which also equals 200 minus 4f from before. Now some simple algebra will tell you f equals 10, and that is the amount of force that I'm exerting onto the fan. Definitely a tedious process, but one which that has many parallels with the already known Newton second law in the linear world. You can see how it's a very similar solving process. Just be sure to know which way is positive, which way is negative, and know all the torques that are happening. Also note the angle that's being pushed at because sometimes they can give a question where they're not pushing perpendicularly and you have to take that into account.
Now, for one last question, we're going to look at a spinning fan with moment of inertia 10 kilograms meter squared, built with blades that reach out 3 meters. It spins at a rate of 5 radians per second. I come in and try to stop it, and after 10 seconds of pure rage-filled energy pushing at the end of the blade, the fan uniformly accelerates to a complete stop. If we assume I always push it perpendicularly throughout the entire ordeal, what is the force that I apply to this fan? This question will take two units, one from kinematics and one from torque. So to begin, let's find our angular acceleration. The initial angular velocity equals 5, while the final angular velocity equals 0. This takes 10 seconds, and since we have three terms, we can use kinematics. So then using the equation omega sub f equals omega sub i plus alpha t, we can rearrange that to get omega sub f minus omega sub i divided by t equals alpha. That gives us 5 minus 0 divided by 10 equals alpha, which is 1 half. This means that the fan had an angular acceleration of 1 half radians per second squared throughout the entire 10 seconds. Now pair this with the moment of inertia, which was given 10, gives us net torque of 5 newton meters. Now that we know the net torque, what are the individual torques at play? Well, in this case, there's only one clear torque source. Me. I push the fan at an unknown force at the end of the fan, which will be 3 meters away. So this gives us force times radius, which is force times 3, and force is unknown, so we get 3F equals 5. So my force throughout the rage-induced rampage would be 5 divided by 3 newtons. So you can see, definitely take note of the individual torques and figure out the net torque as well. So hopefully these questions helped. Net torque is definitely one where if you keep practicing, it should be good. And just remember, it's very similar to the linear, linear Newton second law systems. Just making sure that you're listening to torques correctly should lead you to a lot of success. So I wish you the best of luck in your studies and bye-bye.